Sleep. Okay. And Expo Chicago, guess what? 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 It's time, y'all. Let's get it started. Make some noise for Mr. Carl Weather. Why is it I feel like I've come home? I mean... I, they're all welcoming me like I'm, you know, like a native son here. You, you are an icon, sir. This oh. is what happens when you become oh. an icon. Oh, oh. Okay, now I'm going to do something that you probably weren't expecting. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay. okay. Here we go. Victor, right? Yes, yes, sir. I don't know how many of you folks know this. He didn't expect me to do this because I just found out. <laughs> but when you're talking about genealogy, you're talking about descendants. Victor's last name is Dandridge. That's correct. Of the great Dorothy Dandridge. Yes. 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 Let me tell you, anybody who's ever liked entertainment must recognize that that lady not only was an icon in her time, yes. but to this very day remains one of those legends that anybody in the film business, the entertainment business, business, and certainly if you happen to be African American, but you don't need to be. That's also true. You gotta recognize Dorothy Dandridge, the great Dorothy Dandridge. Thank you. Thank so what an honor for me to get to sit here and say, I am met, <clears throat> you know, just too cool. Thank you, sir. Yeah, man. I didn't know he was gonna do that, and I'm trying not to blush. Yeah, he's <laughs> blushing, though, ain't he? There we go. Ain't he? <laughs> <laughs> sir, you, uh, obviously, we're a fan of so many things of yours. Um, the, the doc had said to talk Star Wars, but we can't start at Star Wars, because we know better. <laughs> we know better. Um, it, no, it, okay, so I'm a child of the 80s, and you are one of the few black action 80 stars and that's such an important thing because yes make some noise for that because there were so many that did not escape the black exploitation era to continue making movies and you were able to do so was that something that you were cognizant of when you were doing that oh boy you know hindsight is always 2020 20, right i can tell you honestly i was cognizant of it yes because as a young kid, I grew up in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and of course, when I was a kid, we had a very, very, very different social structure in this country, and it was like out front socially uh, um, repressive. Mm -hmm. Today, it's a lot more, I'll, I'll use the word discreet. There you go. In some ways, Obviously, we can see our politics of the day. Well, it's not so discreet because of the way women are treated. Well, then. come on now, make some noise for okay. uh, You know, and, and I'm not here to be political. However, we got to admit one thing. This is the country we all live in, mm -hmm. and if you are under a rock or asleep, you may not recognize that a lot of stuff is being turned back. It's not going forward. And that's unfortunate because every one of us comes from a man and a woman. Every one of us had a mother, whether or not we grew up with her. And had it not been for what she went through, we would not be here. So at the end of the day, I just asked the question, who am I to tell that woman mm -hmm. what she should or should not do with her mom? Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, as a man, there ain't too many people telling you what you can or cannot do with facts, your body. Big facts. So we gotta, we gotta like wake up here to reality and appreciate that every human being, every human being has a right to state what they want to do with their bodies. Now you can get into a whole discussion about before birth and all that sort of stuff. That's a whole other kind of discussion, but anyway, you won't be up listen, there. Listen, listen, I'm you sorry, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. So, back to your original question. Yes, I apologize, yes. I did no, digress. Right. Um, I was cognizant of 
some of the, the challenges, mm -hmm. certainly a lot of the inequities, and it wasn't like forefront in my mind, but I grew up, as I said, at a time when you could see it. It was all plain and simple right in front of you. And I aspired to, to be successful beyond what the norms were at the time. And those things that I was attracted to were the things that were on that silver screen. Of course. The things I saw with the Dorothy Dandridges, and you mentioned another great entertainer, Harry Belafonte. Yes, indeed. And with Sidney Poitier. Yes. And with Woody Strode, that a lot of you may not remember, but in a lot of great movies, there was this unbelievably handsome statue of a man named Woody Strode, who was an athlete, played football at SC, was in a lot of great movies, including movies with John Wayne, I mean, John Ford movies, I mean this, and I was, as a young actor, got to sit at Woody's knee oh. and ask a few questions in his home when I was introduced to him. So, I was aware of all that, but once I became a professional, then it was, wait a minute, what can I do? And I don't mean that from a selfish place, but I mean, if I want there to be change, I have to find a way to be changed. Of course, well said. And Very so well said. that was why I was fortunate enough on one hand to have a lot of opportunities that came off the shoulders of those people that I mentioned previously. And I was blessed with a certain amount of talent and I wanted to utilize that to inspire my sons. Of you know, so the kinds of things I choose to do are predicated on one simple phrase. I never want my sons to say to me or ask me, Pop, why did you do that? Wow, wow. And that means when it's your son or daughter also, because they, whether or not you realize it, happen to be my son or daughter <laughs> also, and every other person that they choose to emulate or that they admire. So it's like, what do I want to represent? Right. What I want to endorse? What do I want to be in the world? I want to be those things that create something that's lasting in your mind and hopefully that is inspiring in your mind to do some good. I love that. Give some love to that one right there. Now, one of the first roles that you took on that I think collectively this room can say you embodied so much was Apollo Creed. Now, I've heard a rumor, speaking of your talent, that part of the reason why you were hired for that role was you were critical <laughs> Of Sylvester Stallone's acting. That's, that's, come on, man. I, I, it was a room. Victor. I just want to clear this up for the room Victor. in case anyone was wondering. Words are powerful. Exactly. Let you, me said, know the truth. you said critical. Yes. I wasn't critical, not in my mind. I was in a self surviving mode. And so I'm going to, the story is simple. Mm -hmm. Try to be brief for once in my life. I was there reading for the part. In those days, as a young actor, you know, you're chomping at the bit to get the job. It's like anybody who's ever gone in for an interview, you know how that is. You are so darn nervous, number one. And number two, you want the thing you're going in for. So you're not going to do anything dumb to mess it up, right. hopefully. <laughs> but out of the mouths of babes, I was introduced to a guy in the room and the guy was introduced to me as the writer. Okay. He walks in late in the thing, right? I'm there with the producers and the director. And he sat down and I'm standing, right? And I'm reading and I'm doing my best like to just show them what I can do. That's right. And he's just sitting there and kind of mumbling and going through these guys. He looks up at me every once in a while. So we get to the end of the scenes and uh, the director, John Abelson, is kind of quiet and looking at me and he leans over and says something to the producers and they're all just kind of, you know, Bob shot off and Erwin Winkler and they're kind of whispering and man, my heart plummets because I think, oh man, I blew this one. Oh, come on. I swear I did. And then I said to them just, again, out of self-defense, I said, you know, 
if you get me a real actor, I could do a much better job. <laughs> I was in survival mode. I wasn't trying to insult anybody. So I'm defending myself by saying it worked. It worked. It worked. It worked. <laughs> out question. Yeah, see? So oh give it up, man. I love it. No, I there you go. I love Use it. your words carefully. Okay? I just, like I said, I wanted to clarify for the room in case anyone was wondering he wasn't being critical. <clears throat> <clears throat> he was, so I was a defending it, so that's, that's right, self-defense, there you go. <laughs> now obviously, okay, so you coming from being an athlete, um, already in great shape, played football, boxing was something already in your repertoire. <laughs> no, no, what? I have never boxed. Never? I lied. <laughs> uh, that's how amazing of an actor you hey, are. Let's hey, go. That's it, that's exactly it. <laughs> Look, one thing... Actors know, the young actors in particular, are told very early on, never say no. You, if they ask you, have you ever done sky, you know, you skydive, right? But did you do it without a parachute? Yes! <laughs> Five times! Five times we jumped from 3,000 feet, yes! How did you survive? I have no idea, but I'm standing here talking to you, right? So, you know, when they asked me if I boxed, I played ball in, in the NFL, and then I went to Canada, right? You, right? And I, uh, you know, in off-season, uh, I boxed at these different uh, clubs around Canada, you know? And there's like the Lions Club and this club, and I'd go in there, I was an amateur boxer. Okay, okay, and then they put me in the ring with a real boxer, and he wore my butt out. <laughs> At the end of three minutes, if you really don't know what you're doing, you can hardly lift your arms. Because you're just using so much energy and a lot of arm punching, and as a boxer, you couldn't survive. You could not survive that way, but there was a great, great guy who's no longer with us, a guy named Frankie Crawford, who was like a, a lightweight or a middleweight, and Frankie kind of took a liking to me and showed me some things and said, told them basically he and Jimmy Gambino, who was the little guy in the rain there, would slide. Uh, we think he can do it. So, thank God. Because <laughs> we wouldn't be sitting here talking listen, today listen. were it not for Rocky. Well, with all due respect to Rocky, which we absolutely love, yes? Yes, yes. But it doesn't stop with Rocky. There's so many things that we love. Predator, let's talk about you as a villain in the most iconic handshake of all time. People love that. We don't call it a man shake, Victor. We call it, I mean a handshake, we call it a man, man shake. shake. Okay? <laughs> Way to do that. There you go. That's, okay, so I'm curious, when you were doing that, how big were your biceps? I know you measured those. Were, you say? <laughs> Bigger. I was ready for him because he's good. Okay. <laughs> Look, man, I was never, ever, ever as big around biceps as Arnold. Fair. I just wasn't. Okay. But I was ripped. Listen. I was shredded. You are not wrong. And okay. I worked out like a madman back then. I'm serious. There was a great. Great bodybuilder, an old time bodybuilder, a guy named Vince Gironda. I don't know if anybody in here knows that name. Yeah? Huh? There we go. Well, Vince was one of the old time guys who who trained a lot of movie stars back in the day, you know, and himself dabbled in movies and stuff. But he had a gym called Vince's Gym. Uh, in I, I want to say Toluca Lake, it wasn't. It was Studio City. Okay. In Studio City, near Universal Studios, in fact. And I lived in Bay Area after the Raiders, and I lived there for a long time. But I commuted because I wanted to be an actor in Los Angeles was the place to be. So I'd go down there five days a week. And what are you going to do as an actor? You're not working. You're not auditioning all the time. Get in the gym, man. Get in the gym and work out. Just And I met other actors, so it was a great environment. Yeah. But Vince, man, just taught me how to train. And what he called it was body sculpting. Okay. And so I learned from him, from the very beginning, what kind of exercises to do, mm -hmm. how to do the reps without a lot of heavy weight, okay. because I didn't want to be bulky, right. I just wanted to look big, you know, and look ripped. And so when we did Predator, 
we were all working on it like crazy. Arnold had brought a gym and set up a like a conference room with all the equipment. And once we found out, we were stealing that key, man, and sneaking <laughs> in there. Four o'clock in the morning, go get a workout before somebody else comes in. That's amazing. Know? Yeah. Oh my God, that energy had to be incredible. Um, I did spoilers for Predator. I don't know if is there anyone in here that hasn't seen Predator? Come on. Can't be, unless you're two years old. Yeah, you, we got one handbag that you might want to... You have not seen Predator? What are you doing in here anyway? Come on. <laughs> okay, uh, actually, I'll, put your hand down. I'll try not Don't let the world go. Okay. Hey, is that your dad sitting next to you? Yes? Yeah? Hey, dad. Come on. <laughs> it's time. Come on, it's time. It's all right. I'm just saying. He's not two years old. Yeah. There's nothing really that bad in Predator. Right, 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 right. Right. You can handle gore, right? Because <laughs> what happened is that was kind of it's kind of nasty. But you don't see it. You know that's true. What do you see? You see me and my eyes and my. You hear that yell and yeah. you go, Oh my God! What did you know? I mean, but it kept shooting. That was the problem. I know. That was I know. The gun. <laughs> yes, exactly. On the ground. Yeah, that was that was always the part that beautiful, beautiful stuff, man. It was gorgeous. <laughs> It was magical, it was absolutely magical. But okay, so to be in a sci-fi piece like that, are you a big sci-fi fan? <sighs> Not necessarily, okay. because I, here's why. I never defined it as sci-fi. Okay, okay. You know, I, I mean, I love Alien, right. of course. But I don't define it as sci-fi. For me, <sighs> not, and you know, and I'm not putting down at all, because good movies are good movies. Of course. And so for me, genre is interesting, and genre is strange in a way because if something is just out of this world, out of this earth sort of reality, in the future, whatever, you can term it, term, term it mm -hmm. sci-fi. But if those characters are relatable right. today, here and now, of course. to me it's just the drama that is out of this world. Okay, okay. You know? But I, I get the label yeah. sci-fi, I mean I get it, but Predator I never thought of, and even to this day, I don't think of as particularly sci-fi. Gotcha. Uh, mainly because I'm probably just kind of a weird guy. That's not weird, that's not no, weird. No, but here's why, because I, I, man, I believe with no proof that there are live beings on other planets sure. in this system and other systems, and I've never seen one of them. But none of you have seen God either. And hey, believe in God. Hey, so go. come on, man. That's right. Why not? Keep it open minded. That's yeah. what we do it. I like that. Now, when you saw the Predator for the first time, what was that like? I mean, the actual face mask off, yeah. teeth. Yeah. Like all that, what was that? Uh, amazing. Oh man, I can't. Amazing, believe. really. Because, you know, back then in particular, mm -hmm. and, and anybody who knows anything about Predator, uh, knows a little bit about it, knows that uh, the Predator wasn't the Predator when right. we were making the movie. <laughs> the it Predator came after the movie was made, and the scenes that you saw the Predator finally in with Arnold was shot way after we finished the movie down in a, a southern Mexico in an area called Palenque near the Guatemalan border. And it was all created after because they never figured out what the Predator really was gonna look like. And so the, the brilliance of all of it ultimately was that Winston, right? Dan Winston and, and his creative team and of course the producers and the, you know, ultimately, whoever finances things really ultimately has the last say, but all settled on, you know, this wonderful creature that we'd all been looking at, but of course never saw because the creature wasn't there. It was a laser pointed up in a tree or whatever, you know. And um, when I saw it, man, it was like, wow. That's amazing. But great movie making, and, and you know what? A lot of props in my mind, and you don't hear his name enough is uh, John McTiernan yes. and what he did as a director in shooting that film and the DP, director of photography, was uh, a man named Don McAlpine who was brilliant with his crew. They were all Australian and in that movie we had, our crew was three nationalities, Australian, American, and Mexican. 
Nice. And we shot it all in Mexico, and the rest is history. When I saw it, it was like, wow. That's brilliant. That's that was great. I want to invite everybody to ask questions. We've got two Let microphones over here, so if you ask some questions, feel free to line up. Um, one I've got for you guys, do you know which actor, for a short time, was on deck to play the Predator? They knew that. They knew that. Yeah, yeah, just check it, just check it. I was just starting to time to let people line up. Yes, Jean-Claude Van Damme was originally uh, the Predator with the Black <laughs> Okay, so my last thing before we open it up to the audience. <clears throat> One of the first movies that I absolutely adored that you were in. I might have been a little young to watch it, but it didn't stop me. Action Jackson. Yeah. Now, that movie got me in trouble once because there was a kid that was picking on someone else at school. I wasn't the bully, but I told this young man that I was going to tap dance on his lips. Because that was like the coolest insult. Were you able to, how were you able to keep a straight face with some of the taunts and threats that were delivered at you in that movie? Acting. Nope. Okay. <laughs> that says it all. That says acting. That, that, by the way, I've said this before, but the actual original idea mm -hmm. is an idea I created while we were shooting Predator. Wow. Joe Silver, who was the producer, a prolific producer, needless to say, from a huge, huge blockbuster, uh, uh, what's the, what's the, the series? The, uh, with, what, uh, what did he do? No. No. You mean the production company? The weapon. No, yeah. not well, well he did the weapon. Yeah. But no, the most recent with Keanu Reeves. Uh, with Matrix. Matrix, Matrix. Yeah. 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 okay. And going way, way back to, my God, to... Uh, 1990, I think. 19 what? Yeah. Oh, way before yeah, yeah, 99. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we did yeah, Predator yeah. Joel in 86. Yeah, Joel is No, uh, 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 oh, God, man. So many big movies. Anyway, Whoopi Goldberg did a movie with Whoopi Goldberg way back when. Uh, but um, Joel loved black exploitation movies. I mean, he's a really movie buff. And we were talking one day on set, and he was talking about movies he liked, and I liked some of those movies also, because they were entertaining. And he said, you know, you ought to write something. And I said, of course. That's all you got to tell me. <laughs> so I'd go back in the afternoon after work sometimes or on the day off, sit there and noodle, and I came up with this idea for this guy. That's awesome. And a cop. And, you know, Beverly Hills cop and all that stuff he'd been involved in. And I said, okay, I got to create something. And I'll be damned if one day I was talking to one of the, one of the, one of the crew guys from Australia, mm -hmm. and as young guys do, you know, we're sitting around talking, and girls come up, and he talks about this girl he wanted to date, and he said, man, and then I was in, like, Action Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Title! There it is! <laughs> Title! So I'd written this thing and put that on there, and literally from the time I handed it to Joel, yeah. when we were in... Puerto Vallarta shooting Predator, 11 months later, we were shooting a wow. movie called Action Jackson. That's incredible. Fast. I love it. I love it. Make some noise. <laughs> Let's open this up to your fans and friends out here. Hello, friend. How are we doing? Hey, how are you doing? Um, Mr. Weathers, I wanted to ask, and I'm sure you get this a lot, but even though actors will not want to pick their favorite film they've been in or acted in, is there something that you've walked away with a film going, that really touched me in a way that I'll never forget? Way to work that. Boy. You know, that's, that's a question that gets asked a lot. And honestly, every time I do something that I really enjoy, you just walk away with that kind of feeling, you know? However, I keep looking to the next thing. What's next? So I don't hang on very much of what was last or the one before that, because it's done, man. I can't do anything else with it. I can always dream, oh, and think, oh, man, if I'd only done this and that, you know, but that's like a surgeon going in doing surgery and coming back to you. You know, you'd be a lot better if I'd done this. <laughs> too late, buddy, too late. You sewed me up already. Um, so, no, I, I don't. I don't necessarily think about things that way, but you know what, I do my best when I'm doing what I'm doing, and if you're entertained, man, that's the job, you know? Thank you. 
Hello, friend. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, just saying, you played in such legendary characters, legendary roles as the years have gone on, um, going all the way back to the 70s. Um, the experience of filming has obviously changed from being on set with Arnold and Rocky and all you know that to the volume. Which would you say as an actor is harder to do? Is it easier when you were back, back, on, back on set or is it better on the volume? Great question. Well, for those of you who don't know what the volume is, yeah. um, The Mandalorian is the perfect example. We have a large sound stage and what you basically have is you have a lot of computer driven images so that uh, what you're seeing is actually what you're seeing. What you see in the movie is what we, the actors, get a chance to see also. And we're affected by that. I mean, if it's, if you're on a precipice and it, you know, is 18 <laughs> stories below you, it looks like 18 stories below you. And if you put on, you know, certain glasses like Oculus, these glasses that you give you really 3D sort of effect, and I <clears throat> have vertigo. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a flat floor, but those glasses, man, it looks like you're going to go over the edge. So the answer to your question is, what I do isn't different, and how I do it isn't different. Uh, I hope I'm getting better at the craft. Absolutely. And so that, well, you know, uh, people kind of just keep repeating themselves. But, you know, if I'm getting better at the craft, Maybe what happens is I'm translating better what's on that page and more um, I'm, getting, I'm looking for the right word because it's not necessarily emotion. Let's just call it more authentically. There we go. I'm translating it more authentically so that it connects with you on a human level, you know, and you don't see the acting. What you really do is you get the feeling, and that's what you walk away with, you know, that, that, that great Maya Angelou quote, and I'm gonna tear it to shreds, but basically it's that people don't remember what you said, they remember how you made them feel. There it is. And so for me as an actor, what I'm constantly looking to do, no matter what the role is, is bring it to you with feeling. And if you feel it, done my job, man. Because guess what, you'll remember it. Thank you. Hello, friend. Hello. So I got two questions. I loved you as Chubbs. You're Happy only allowed your one question. Oh, come you on. can't get your money back now. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As I'm saying, I love you as Chubbs and Happy Girl was probably my favorite movie you've ever done. I got my hand back. Yeah. Um, and the one question I've got is what was your favorite scene out of the seasons you've done on The Mandalorian? Wow. Favorites. Yeah, you know what, there is a scene that sticks out for me in memory. And it was with Werner Herzog, okay? And it's when, when we're all sitting there in the bar and the very first time that the Mandalorian comes up and I'm about to finagle and get him to go out and do my dirty work as head of the Bounty Hunters League and just give him a little pay for it, you know? And uh, he doesn't fall for the okie doke <laughs> and Werner's and that whole thing, you know, that that was so memorable because I read I, just kind of with a, one of those little things that give you some, gives you a little insight. And when I read certain things and depending on what's written and how it's written, it reminds me of certain actors or scenes that I've seen in movies because we all steal, basically, you know? Nobody's creating anything new. I mean, the electric cars have been around a lot longer than Musk has been around, okay? They were around way back when. So it's the right time for something, you know? And when I read that first script and there was that scene in it, there was something about it that reminded me of the great John Houston. There was something about the largesse in it and the way you get someone to do something you want, you know? And how can you convince them to get what you want to get out? Yeah. There was that in it. 
And so I utilized a little bit of that where he's sitting there and he's just enjoying himself and knowing none of them in here, Mando, none of them. But you, Mando, see, you know what I'm talking about. It's just the way. Thank you. It's just the way to utilize all those great, great, great inspirations that you've had as an actor or as a performer, or even as a business person, you know, you find that business person who you found has created some magic and you say, aha, that's a way to do it, you know, that's a nice little way of kind of getting in there Amazing. and achieving what you want. Oh my God, I think we're all ready to go get the child right now. We're like, yeah, we can do, we can do this. Yeah. I could be the Mando. Yeah. Absolutely. Hello, so, friend. So speaking of the child, I came all the way from St. Louis to ask this question. What is your favorite part and favorite thing that you've done with Grogu? Mm. Wow. Okay. I had a, you know, in movies and television, a lot of stuff you just do that's not written. And... I think it was season two, when Mando comes back to the town and comes off the ship, and I haven't seen them in a while, and I grab the baby, and I raise him up, and just, oh, it's so good to see you, blah, blah, blah. And then I turn to Mando and say, you know, he said he likes me. <laughs> that was just what happened for me. But you know, for me, the reason it works is so simple. You love the baby. If I love the baby and the baby loves me, you're going to love me too. <laughs> if you watch any dad with his little child, don't you go, oh, that's so sweet. Hey, man, I'm stealing all the time, okay? <laughs> Using, learning. That's yes, exactly. But be honest, it's stealing, okay? <laughs> but you're not hurting anybody. That's what right. you're doing is you're reprising some greatness that you saw, that you recognized, that you witnessed somewhere. That's amazing. And as a father, you know, my sons are a little heavy and a little older now for that. But, <laughs> but, but it's still uh, there, though. I remember. Still there. Yeah, the love is still there. I love it. Thank, Thank you. you. Great Thank you. Hello, friend. Hi. Oh, see, I really thought you were, okay. Yes, no exactly. <laughs> a Trandoshan? No. Um, so, speaking of deeper Star Wars things, were you much of a Star Wars fan before The Mandalorian? Mm. Put me on the spot. Really yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> we did uh, not ask those questions. There are Star Wars fans, and there are Star Wars fans. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll be absolutely honest with you. I wasn't one of those Star Wars fans. Okay, okay. Okay, I liked it, I appreciated it. A uh, couple of the actors I met and worked with, one, and was a real fan of them and a fan of Carrie Fisher, and had seen so much of, yes, the great Carrie Fisher. And had seen so much of what George, George Lucas had done, so I certainly was a fan there. And you know, when you're talking about you know, stealing, borrowing, whatever it is you want to call it. Man, when somebody does something great, you got to look at it and say, whoa, what is that all about? I want some of that. Sure. Now, you know, you start studying and emulating. So it's not so much I was a fan, I guess, as I was a fan, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I appreciated it, man, and I loved it. And, you know, who would have thunk all these years later? I met Mark Hamill, brief story, I met Mark Hamill my God, somewhere in the 70s, after we'd done Rocky. Okay. And Rocky came out in 77, so it was probably like 78 maybe, or 77. And he'd seen it, right? He'd seen Rocky. And <laughs> I was in San Francisco doing an episode of Streets of San Francisco because I worked on all those Quinn Martin shows back in those right. days. I did them all, and Quinn Martin he would use basically utilize the same actors over and over. And back then, you could do Barnaby Jones as a good guy in the beginning of the season, and then at the end of the season, you're a bad guy. <laughs> and then I'd do Cannon, and then I'd do you know, Streets, and then I'd do something else. And I'm sitting on the set, makeup between scenes, and we're down in San Francisco at the pier, and where we were shooting, one of those large, large warehouses there. And here's this young guy walking down the pier toward us. He comes up. I'm in a chair. Makeup artist is doing her work. 
And he sits in the other chair. He says, oh, man, I, you know, I saw you in Rocky. I loved you. It's a great movie. About and he went on and on, so effusive. And I'm thinking, thank you, man. Thank you, you know. Feels good, right? And he said, you know, I just finished a little movie. I think it's going to be as big as Rocky. <laughs> sure. Now, in my mind, I'm saying, hold on, dude. <laughs> hold on, dude. You, you, you know, you... <laughs> You're kind of uh, talking about a tree here, that's a big tree, okay? Now, backwards, when we finished Rocky, I told people, true story, I think it's going to be as big as Jaws. <laughs> I guarantee you they were looking on me like, hold on, dude, hold on. <laughs> well, Mark was talking about Star Wars. Of course. Out of the mouths of babes, man, you never know. So. I was a fan. I was a fan. Okay, back yeah. to that. Anyway, yes. I love it. Thanks very much. My Thank pleasure. Man. My pleasure. Hello, friend. How are you doing? In Star Wars: The Forces of Evil, you played Omni Matrix. Uh, Omni Matrix. Yes. And a lot of Star Wars: The Forces of Evil is the minority like allegory. But Omni Matrix is very much on not only the majority side, but I want to perpetuate this power imbalance. Since you're stealing from everywhere, how do you like get from like I happen to be minority to if I was in the majority and trying to like keep this power imbalance going, how would I act? How would I perform that character? Interesting question. Man, that's some heady stuff. Right. <laughs> Existential. Whoa, it's right. No man. kidding, man. No kidding. Brother, you, you better get a block going or something, man. You got some stuff going on there. Man, that's a, that's a tough question to answer in this forum because that's a discussion. That's not a, a you know, like a yes or no answer, man. The only thing I can tell you is this. You used one word. I've never thought of myself as minority. Ever. And... I suppose that's a way of identifying, you know, and, and I get the identification and I get why, I get the definition, I get all of that. But there's some, there's a concept that I was introduced to a while ago, and fortunately I'd like to think I am being educated constantly. And they were talking about this country and the utilization of the word slave, and that people were slaves. And somebody much more intelligent than I brought up the fact that, no, these people... Are people that other people are treating like this. No, they, they are enslaved. Right. Right. They are not slaves. Right. Nobody comes up and is born and said, I'm a slave! Right. That's just not the way life goes. But they were enslaved, and so I get the utilization of the word minority, but if I thought of myself that way, I don't think I'd be sitting on this stage, man. Yeah. Well, you know? Very well said. I think of myself, I think of myself as a human being um, in process, and as I said, in constant state of education, and so when I look out, I look at what is going down and do my best to articulate it artistically and somehow define it through the behavior and the relationships that I have on screen or off screen, you know? So if I allowed myself to be defined as a minority, what would that say about the way I behave? Well said. You know, well said. I get the uber yeah. culture and all that sort of stuff. But that minority thing, man, I think is a disservice when we, when we identify ourselves that way. I get minority in terms of numbers. I get minority in terms of opportunity. I get minority in terms of, of uh, replicated history and how that's told. But another way to look at it is just 
That's just a different person. That's all. I appreciate it. Anyway, thanks, man. Thank you. Anyway, thanks, man. Thank you. I think to, to piggyback on that one, the understanding that there's a difference between defining what you are and who you are. And what you are can be a series of outward traits, but who you are is something that will always dominate out no matter what. That is that is brilliant. Yeah, I, I think I think also, you know, that great statement about character, mm -hmm. you know, character is something that you display when no one is looking. Yes. You know, when there's nothing to gain. That speaks to your character. And we utilize it in the film business as something on paper, but you know, I have never, as long as I've been a professional anyway, thought of a character as something that's on the page because most of you, when you first were introduced to Apollo Creed, saw this quote unquote badass <laughs> and somebody that you love to hate. Well, guess what? Ask yourself how many of you cried when Apollo Creed died. Yeah? By design, by design, when I was crafting that character, it was never with the thought that he was a bad person. And what translated to you ultimately, hopefully, was an array of traits that many of you also related to in this man, in this great athlete, in this bombastic, egoistic, <laughs> um, take no prisoners kind of attitude. Right. But you saw his humanity in there also when he saw Rocky was <clears throat> out, throws up his hands, turns around and sees Rocky's not out and went, Oh man. <laughs> I gotta get to work now. That's not on the paper. That's how can you translate something about this guy right. that maybe you would never have known, but you can relate to because you've experienced that too. <laughs> you oh. thought they were out and done with and they come back again. It's like, holy moly, what <laughs> does it take, you know? Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Hello. Mr. Weathers, sir. Yes, sir. I may say you are epic. Thanks. 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 Yes. Epic yes. handshakes, epic boxing matches, epic co-stars, epic space adventures. You're it's too much to live up to, man. <laughs> it's too much to live up to. You've already done it. It's too much. Jeez. Jeez. Your career is and has always been epic, right? You mentioned earlier that in setting up your epic career, you had one thought that resonated is you don't want your kids to look back and say, why did you do that? Now, I'm a father of seven, so that resonated with me, right? Looking back on your mass array of epicness, what is something that you can look back at and you can now look at your kids and say, look, I am so proud that I have done this. Wow, that's a, that's a big question, my friend. That's a big question. Well, first and foremost, I appreciate the platitudes, I really do, okay? Uh, the idea has always been, since I was a kid and got that first round of applause in an audience when I was in grade school doing a play that is so heady that, you know, that, that terrible line, they like me, they really like me. That's exactly what you go through as a kid, you know? Um, so I appreciate, you know, all the words, man, the sentiment. Um, but in answer to the question, and this is like God's truth, the thing I'm most proud of, Go ahead. Yeah. Try to choke me yeah, up. Yeah, that's all right, that's all right. My two sons. <laughs> because, because they're both such great human beings. They're both great fathers. Far better than I could have ever been. I mean that sincerely. I owe a lot of that. They owe a lot of it to their mother. Um, but the fact that they're such great human beings 
you know, you kind of feel like, hmm, I didn't screw that up, <laughs> you know? Because the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It just doesn't. So I'd like to take credit for it all. I can't, as I said, because the mother really, I know in my heart, and then she's heard it from me, and they've heard it from me. She was a monumental mother, and a hell of a job. Uh, but my son, you know, There's something, there's something about that thing, that connection, that supersedes everything. You know, nothing can touch that. Nothing. So, thank you, man. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah. So, I, I hate to be the, that guy, but it's hard to top that question and that response, but we've run out of time. I am so oh, sorry. Oh. It's because Please. I'm so long-winded. No, 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 no. You're gracious with your time and, and your stories. Uh, but why did he take me there? That's all I got. <laughs> I was doing great. No, no, no. Really we appreciate the authenticity of it all. That's one of the reasons why we love you so. And we're going to share that noise right now. Make some noise. Thank you. Please Thank you. come see him downstairs. Ask your questions there. Thank you. Thank you. We'd love to talk to you. One more time, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Paul Thank you. I appreciate you all. Go out and see a movie. Don't just sit at home. Go out and see a movie. Thank you.